Welcome to this second session of the Behavioral Exchange Conference. Um, I, I hope most of you were here for the previous session. I think it's off to an absolutely Im immense start um, with that starting cast and Cass's uh, talk. So um, I'm Jennifer Rubin. I'm the Executive Chair of the Economic and Social Research Council. And it's my very great pleasure to take the time today to find out more about how behavioral science can help make its contribution to, attacking, uh, to tackling the, the great social and political and behavioral challenges of our time. So we have a fantastic international lineup today, which I'm going to introduce in a moment. But first, we just have a word from someone who couldn't actually Hello, be everybody. Here. It's great to speak to you all. I know lots of important people are there, and they do say that BX is going to be fantastic this year. The best conference the world has ever seen, and this session in particular is a winner. Many people say to me, and you wouldn't know this listening to the fake news media. Mr. President, you really are a fantastic speaker. It's so true. Great. Well, so that's wonderful. Um, yeah, it's great that Grant Chaps could take time out from Westminster. Um, other other uh, heads of state can take time out to say that I, I think all he said was that this is the most important thing happening in the world right now, right? That's all he said, or at least it's all I heard. So maybe we can examine that later. Um, so we have a fantastic uh, lineup today for our tackling uh, disinformation with behavioral science. Um, we have Professor Tali Sharat, who's here from University College London. She's Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at UCL, and she'll be starting. Um, following Tali, we have Sander van der Linden, who's assess Assistant P Professor of Social Psychology at the University of Cambridge. Um, and then Antonio Silva, here from uh, the Behavioral Insights team, as Head of Integration and Social Cohesion, will be up next. And then, um, after all of those uh, have done their talks, we will be joined by Lizzie McKee, who's Head of Behavioral Science in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office's open source unit, the OSU. So there's more information on all of the speakers up on the website. Um, it is my very great privilege to chair this session, and I will now hand over to Tali to begin. Thank you so much. So. Um, before we can start tackling misinformation, uh, we need to understand what are the factors that determine whether someone engages with and believes misinformation. And really, the factors are the same regardless of whether the information is factually correct or factually incorrect. And they are the source of the information, the content of the information, um, and the characteristics of the consumer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these factors, and I'm going to start with source. So it probably comes as no surprise to anyone if I say that people turn to news sources that are politically like-minded to them to get their updates. So Democrats are more likely to turn to CNN, um, and Republicans are more likely to turn to Fox. But the question is, does that generalize in the sense that do people, would they rather get their information from like-minded individuals? And is this true for all sorts of content? So not only political <coughs> issues, but also science and health. What about the weather? Would a Democrat rather get their weather forecast from another Democrat? And what happens when the Democrat sees that this Democratic uh, weather forecaster gets the weather wrong again and again and again? but the Republican uh, forecaster gets the weather right again and again and again. Will they be able to learn who has the accurate information about the weather, and would they be able to then turn to the person with the most accurate information? Or does knowing about someone's political orientation interfere with our ability to assess their accuracy on a whole host of different domains? So this is a question that we wanted to study, and we conducted an experiment to study this. We had people interact online, and they could learn about each other's political views, and at the same time, they also uh, did a task that had nothing to do with politics. They had to categorize shapes. And the idea was, could they learn who's uh, good at this shape categorization task? Um, and once they learn who's good, would they turn to that person to get good information? Or will the uh, political orientation of people interfere with their ability to do this? So this is uh, what we did. 
On each trial, people saw a shape like this, and they had to decide whether the shape was a blap or not a blap. So blap is something that we made up, but we told the subjects, you had to figure out what are the rules that we use to categorize the shapes into blaps or not blaps. Maybe it's cold colors are blaps and warm colors are not blaps. So you learn via trial and error. And you're not doing this alone. You can also see the answers of four other individuals. Um, and we had, everything was online, so these four other individuals were represented by animals in order to reduce bias related to gender and race. Now, unbeknownst to our subjects, these other animals were not representing humans, but were actual uh, boots that we designed such that two of these were really good at the blap shape uh, task. They were accurate 80% of the time, and two were not very good at the blap task. They were accurate only 50% of the time. So they could see the answers of these animals, so in principle, they should be able to learn who's good at blap and who's not good at blap. And while they were doing this, they also answered politically oriented questions. For example, uh, do you think that um, immigrants abuse the welfare system? And they could also see the answers of these animals. Um, again, the animals were not representing real people, unbeknownst to our subjects, but they were representing algorithms that we wrote, such that two of these animals always agreed, 80% of the time agreed with the subjects, so they were politically like-minded, and two of these animals disagreed with the subjects most of the time, so they agreed only 20% of the time. So they did this, and then came the test, which was they had to do the black task again, but this time, before they put in their final answer, they could choose between two of these animals who they wanted to see their answer, um, and then they could change their own answer. And the question is, who do they turn to? Those that are really good at blaps, or those that are politically like-minded? We paid them according to how well they did, so they really were incentivized to do a good job. So let's see what happened. So what I'm going to be plotting here on the y-axis is a percent uh, of times that each source was chosen. In green, I will be showing you the um, percentage of people who chose the most accurate, uh, sorry, the politically like-minded source. In purple, the uh, politically different sources. Um, here on the uh, left, those sources with accurate information, and here on the right, those sources with random information, so not very good at blaps. Um, first of all, quite reasonably, uh, the subjects tended to choose those with more accurate blab information, so that's great. However, politics had an important effect as well. So what you can see here that in general, people preferred the green sources, those that are politically like-minded to them to get their information about blabs, than the purple ones, which are politically different to them. In fact, the bias was so strong that people preferred this guy over here, um, which is really uh, politically like-minded but not very good at blaps, uh, versus this guy over there who is really good at blaps but um, politically different to them. So we have a bias by which people turn to the politically like-minded to get information even if the information is not about politics and even if they should have all the evidence in front of them to turn to those who do have the most accurate information. So why is that? Well, we asked our subjects, can you rate these animals on how politically similar they are to you? And can you rate them on how good they are at blaps? And looking at the data, what we found that there was an illusion that emerged in the subject's mind by which those sources that were more politically like-minded, perceived to be more politically like-minded, were also perceived to be better at the blap task, to have better blap information. Now, in, in reality, there was no correlation between the two. The correlation was zero. But in the subject's mind, there was this relationship between these two factors. Okay, so they turn to the politically like-minded for information. Do they also believe that information more if it comes from the politically like-minded? Um, and the answer was yes. So now I'm gonna plot the percentage of time that people changed their minds when they got information from the four different sources. Um, and first of all, quite reasonably, they're more likely to change their minds when they get information from the accurate sources than the less accurate sources. Um, however, again, there is an effect of politics. They were more likely to believe those green individuals who are politically like-minded to them than the purple ones which are politically different on these black 
issues. So this study was conducted by my PhD student, Joe Marks, together with uh, Cass Seinstein. And Cass and I wrote an op-ed about this to um, a left-leaning uh, journal in the United States. And the editor gave it this title, which was, Would You Go to a Republican Doctor? Um, and this title, as the reaction shows, uh, created quite a stare. And there were you know, about 1,000 comments within the first day. And kind of sampling these comments, it became quite obvious that the answer was no. People said, no, I would not go to um, a doctor from the other side of the fence. I would not go to a lawyer from the other side of the fence. And why wouldn't they? Well, here's um, quite um, a representative answer. This is from a, a physician, and this is what he says in one of the comments. Those physicians with strong Republican, <laughs> conservative, right-leaning views are nearly always less competent than their less political or even left-leaning colleagues. Some, in fact, are simply awful. I can't explain this impression beyond mere observation, so I won't attempt to provide a rationale. Um, in other words, we believe that those from uh, the other party are not as accurate, they won't give us good diagnosis or good advice. We can't explain this, but it doesn't matter. It is our perception, it is what we're gonna act upon. So um, it looks like we're more likely to turn to and believe people who are politically similar on issues unrelated to politics, even when those individuals are not experts in the room. Now this creates a problem because it means that we're gonna take at face value information coming from people from our own party, right? Even when that information can be wrong and vice versa. We might reject information that is very good but coming from people from the other side. So you may say, well, perhaps the answer is to give information from neutral sources, like scientists, for example. Well, it turns out that that's not a very good um, solution either because people tend to assume what the political orientation is of a scientist based on the content that they study. So this is um, an experiment by Varga and Al that was conducted here in the UK. And what they did is they gave subjects different articles to read, and then they said, hey, what do you think is a political orientation of the scientist that wrote this article? So one article was about the flu, and people didn't have um, an opinion about what the scientist, whether he was a Democrat or a conservative. Again, this is in the UK. Then they gave them an article about marijuana use, and they found that uh, people believe that the scientist who wrote this article is most likely to be a conservative. And they believe that a scientist who wrote an article about climate change is more likely to be a Democrat. So there's this interaction between content and source. Based on the content, we make assumption about the source. What is the political views of, in this case, the scientists? Now, a related issue is that we're also more likely to believe the content if it fits our ideology, if it fits our priors. We conducted a study uh, to look at this in the domain of climate change, where we gave people misinformation and we wanted to see how this misinformation will affect their beliefs. So the first thing we did, we uh, did this online on 400 individuals, and we asked them, hey, do you believe in climate change? Do you support the uh, Paris Agreement? And based on their answers, we divided them into those who were skeptical and those who were strong uh, believers. And we asked them, by how much do you think the temperature would rise in the next 100 years? So they gave their answers, and unsurprisingly, those who were skeptical gave an answer that was lower than those who were uh, strongly believed in climate change. Um, and then came the big test. We told half of our subjects that the scientists have looked at the data and now believe that they made a mistake, and in fact, the temperature would rise by only a small amount. Um, and please give your new estimate. We told the other half of our uh, subjects that the scientists have reassessed the data and now believe that things are much, much worse than what they thought before and the temperature would rise by a very, very large amount and please give us your new estimate. What we found was that those who began by being skeptic when they heard that the scientists are saying, actually, we made a mistake, the temperature is not gonna rise by much, they moved a lot in that direction, but they didn't budge at all when they were told that the scientists 
looked at the data again and believed that things were much worse. So here I'm just plotting how much they update their estimates, and you can see they update them more when they hear that things are actually okay. Um, those who are strong believers did the opposite. So when they heard that the scientists are saying things are much, much worse than we previously thought, they upped their estimate, believing that temperature would rise even more, um, and less so when they heard that the scientists are saying, actually, it's not that bad. So um, this is an example of the well-known confirmation bias, but what it shows is that when you give information out to the public, people are more likely to take the information that fits their beliefs to change their mind. And what this results in this case is polarization, right? Because people actually move apart, becoming more extreme rather than coming together. We wanted to know what goes on inside the human brain when people encounter information or opinions that doesn't fit their own. So we conducted another study where we brought people into our lab in pairs, and this time we wanted to them to engage on a topic that has nothing to do with politics. We asked them to assess real estate. And we scanned their brains while they were doing that in two separate brain imaging scanner, but they could interact over the Wi-Fi. So the way that it works, they lie down like this. There's a head coil with a little mirror that you might be able to see. And the mirror projects everything that we put on a screen um, behind them. So they can see the opinions of the other person. And they can put, on their, put in their own opinions using the button boxes. What we found was when two people agreed, each person's brain showed precise encoding of the information coming from the agreeing partner. So we have statistical methods that allows us to look at this. And what happened to people's opinion about their own, um, about their own beliefs, the, the confidence in their own beliefs? It went up, which makes sense. If someone agrees with me, I become more confident in my opinion. But when two people disagreed, metaphorically speaking, it looked like the brain was shutting down, and it wasn't encoding the information coming from the disagreeing partner. And what happened to people's confidence in their own opinion? It went down, but by a much smaller degree. So this again shows us that we're more likely to take information that comes from agreeing partners than information that comes from disagreeing partners. But the interesting thing in this experiment was that people were also always interacting with the same person, right? But when the person was agreeing, they took in the information more when the person was disagreeing with them. Um, so in terms of content, we're more likely to seek and believe information that supports what we already believe or what we want to believe. Um, and finally, I'm just going to say two words about the characteristics of the consumer. Um, and here, there is um, quite controversy on whether the characteristics of the consumer matter and in which direction. So um, on one hand, there is uh, data from uh, Dan Kahan at Yale University suggesting that people with better math and analytical skills um, actually have more of motivational biases, the type of biases that I told you about today, because they're more likely to twist data at will. On the other hand, we have uh, data from David Rand at MIT and others suggesting that perhaps if you have better analytical and math skills, you're actually better at finding the truth. Um, in either case, what our data shows is that these biases exist in all these populations. So we do these studies online with a range of different individuals. We also have done these studies on MIT students. And in all these populations, uh, we do see that people have strong motivational biases in terms of who they turn to for information and what they believe. Um, so I think the kind of bottom line here is that we need to take into account what we call motivational reasoning um, when we're trying to figure out how to tackle misinformation. And I'll just end by uh, thanking uh, my students who conducted this research, uh, Joe Marks, L. Copland, and Eleanor Lau, Stephanie Lazaro, and Sebastian uh, Suarez, and our collaborator, Cass, on this project. Thank you. Following that fascinating talk on belief formation, um, I kind of want to look at interventions and what we can do to combat fake news and misinformation. And I always start here because my journey into this topic started when David Kay, who's the uh, 
um, UN Special Rapporteur for the Protection for the Freedom of Speech, invited me to a, a session in Wilton Park to talk about what is fake news and what can we do about it. And Google and Facebook and other companies and other country representatives were there. And I wasn't quite sure why I was there, because I'm a psychologist. But it, I quickly realized that near the end of all of our discussions, um, they were quite skeptical about the plausibility um, and the validity of, for example, using the law as an instrument um, to legislate fake news, um, for governments to intervene. And they actually started to become really receptive um, to thinking about the solutions that behavioral and psychological science could offer. So I thought that was a quite uh, an interesting outcome. Now, we use the term fake news. I don't want to spend a whole lot of this, but I have a definition that I maintain uh, to help sort out uh, from a psychological perspective what, what the real issue is. I don't think we're really that concerned about misinformation, which I define as just stuff that's incorrect. Right? You, um, you make an error, nobody's fault. I don't think we're that concerned about it. I think we're more concerned about disinformation, uh, which is misinformation coupled with some psychological intent to actually harm or deceive other people. And when you couple that with a specific political agenda, then we add up to propaganda. So I think that's sort of the area that we're more concerned about, and that's sort of the area that I like to target um, in particular. So I have a quiz, because I have a room here full of brilliant minds. Um, so I wanted to see to what extent you all um, can recognize fake news uh, when you see it. So two of these headlines um, are fake and one is true. So if you had to vote, which of these would be true? So the first one is Putin issues international arrest warrant for George Soros, who think that was a real headline. All right. Few brave individuals out in the back. Uh, Black Lives Matter thug protests President Trump with selfie, accidentally shoots himself in the face. Who think that really happened? OK. A few people. Now we get passenger allowed into flight after security confiscate his bomb. Who think that really happened? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. We have a good audience here. My explanation for this is that this happened in Canada, so they were super friendly. And uh, <laughs> I'm like, it's all right. Um, but you guys are pretty good. I think this is, uh, this is the first time I've seen so many get it right. So maybe you don't need my interventions. Um, so actually, I was going to say something about deep fakes, but the conference already preempted me with this deep fake of, uh, of Trump uh, introducing the, uh, the conference. Um, and, it, and it's interesting, because of, regardless of whether images are, are real or not, people can now manipulate them. People can manipulate visuals, um, and they can say whatever they want. To, uh, to accompany those visuals, right? Largest audience ever. Doesn't even matter if this was a real picture or not. I could, I could tweak it and dupe some people with it. And I think that's really concerning. Um, so in our interventions, I gave a talk at the Hay Festival not too long ago, and they asked me for a quote. Um, and I started thinking about what we really need with these sort of new ways of deceiving people and new ways of duping people um, is a, a new defense uh, against the dark arts, to borrow a Harry Potter metaphor. In fact, I take this metaphor um, quite far. My students love it when I talk about Harry Potter. Um, but Professor Snape does uh, have an important lesson. He said, your defenses must therefore be as flexible and inventive as the arts that you seek to undo. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to get at here, is a new approach um, that is as flexible as some of the challenges that we're dealing with. And this is where the idea of the fake news vaccine came from. It's very much based on the vaccine metaphor, originally developed by McGuire, who was a social psychologist stationed in the uh, Department of War and Information during uh, um, World War II, one of the few psychologists, social psychologists working on what they would call the laws of persuasion at that time. Um, and uh, he had some very interesting ideas. Of course, the, this was before the internet, and they really weren't looking at misinformation and fake news specifically, but the metaphor still holds. Um, you can preemptively vaccinate people against information by letting them build up mental antibodies. And, and we've really taken that metaphor and tried to, uh, to apply it. And of course, the end goal is herd immunity. Right? I think the whole key here is that if you want to tackle this problem, you need to prevent the spread of disinformation in the first place. How do you do that? By inoculating enough individuals so that information doesn't have a chance to spread and take hold. And that's really the key lesson. The ESRC asked us to write a bit about this, and so I borrowed a metaphor from uh, Benjamin Franklin, of course, that an ounce of prevention um, is worth a pound of cure. And I think really that's the, uh, the key thing. 
So just as with regular vaccines, you inject a weakened, severely weakened dose of the virus into your body to allow for the generation of antibodies to help confer resistance against future infection, turns out you can do the same with misinformation. Um, by injecting yourself with a severely weakened dose of the virus, of the informational virus, you can create mental antibodies to help you resist um, infection um, from future disinformation attacks. So that's really the theoretical premise of the idea. We applied this in the context of a very controversial issue. Tali talked about this, climate change, people very polarized. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this now. Um, but we did a study trying to inoculate people against specific disinformation techniques that have been used in the context of global warming um, by preemptively exposing them to weakened examples of such specific techniques, um, which is interesting because in the context of climate, there's been disinformation campaigns for many years, uh, long before the sort of fake news era. Um, so what we tried to do is look at some of the common disinformation techniques and inoculate people, and we found that that was effective. Um, and that's kind of where the, the headline came from. We actually didn't um, come up with this idea um, of the fake news vaccine, but the media did, and so we kind of you know, ended up having to run with that. Um, but the idea was this. Journalists asked me, this is great, but how can we implement it? We can't sort of inoculate people against every specific issue that's about to come out. So how could you scale this approach? And I think for, for the behavioral science audience, there's a key question. How can you scale it? Um, and we thought this is a great question. We can't design inoculation treatments for every issue, right? Design a vaccine, create a weakened dose of the pathogen for every issue, and then go ahead and preemptively inoculate people. So we thought, how can we scale this? We had two ideas. One was we need to focus on the techniques that underlie the production of most fake news and inoculate people against the techniques rather than the specific content. And two, and this was driven by um, PhD student John Rosenbeek, um, let's gamify the whole approach. Because people play games, they share games, people learn better through games because you can simulate things. Um, and we thought this was a quite a promising technique. Of course, the media came up with these vaccine metaphor. You know, I understand that it's, that it's close. In fact, one journalist called me and said, is this fake news? Um, and I said, well, you're the journalist. Play the game and you're, you'll find out. So here's John with the serious CNN face. And, um, um, he explained the, the idea of the game, and this is done with a company called uh, Bad News. They're a media literacy organization that tackles uh, disinformation, um, a design studio. So it's not just us, it's a big operation, lots of parties involved, lots of students. Um, and we created a paper version of this game and tested that in schools before we went digital. We thought there's an important element lacking here, because um, if you play games with kids in schools, um, you, know, you don't have the online element. So it was crucial to actually build an engine that simulates social media um, to allow people to inoculate themselves against these disinformation um, techniques. So how does it work? So here's bad news. You play the game. And you really, you step into a shoe. Donald Trump again. This was just a subliminal um, sort of message. Um, you step into the shoes of a fake news creator, right? So what's the best way to inoculate people against deception by letting people do the deception themselves? So I tend to use a magic show metaphor. Um, if you go to see a magic show, you know, you tend to be duped the first time around. So there's two ways to fix that. I could educate you with facts, a traditional approach, and tell you how it works. Or, and this is our approach, I can let you do the trick and find out for yourself how it works. What better way is there to remember and really think about and learn about how something works um, than to do it yourself. I think Mark Twain once said, a man who carries a cat by the tail learns something he can learn in no other way. Um, I think that's probably true. No one should carry a cat by the tail, but um, I'm sure that's, uh, that's true. So what happens in the game? So you have a follower meter and a credibility meter. So you attract followers by spreading misinformation uh, without losing credibility. So here's the first um, sort of Twitter attempt. Um, After long deliberation with my generals, I have decided to declare war in North Korea, hashtag Kim Jong Dun. Um, and so here's where you're impersonating um, Donald Trump. And this is part of what we call the impersonation badge. Um, Donald Trump, because we manipulated his Twitter handle, uh, most people, when we test people in the game, they fall for this technique uh, quite easily. Um, goes on, mainstream media is one massive conspiracy, hashtag fake news. So you create your own hashtag, you can create echo chambers, false amplification, so on. Here you're impersonating NASA. Meteorite alert, large space objects have to hit the US West Coast, hashtag be safe. So you can tweet stuff out, people respond to you. There's a voice of reason in the game that tries to nudge you in the direction of the disinformation tycoon. You can die a hero if you want to, of course, and quit the game. 
Um, so there's six lessons. Tali talked about this. Polarization, which is a big one. The use of emotions in online content, discrediting other people, right? Your fake news, conspiracy theories, trolling other people, and so on. There's more out there, but we focused on six very common ones. And so after you complete the level, you get a badge. It explains what technique you've just learned. You move on to the next level. Um, all of the content we use is fictional, because I think there's two issues in this literature more generally. If you use real fake news, there's a confound with people's memory. Um, so you might just know that something is true or fake because you remember it. So we created our stuff from scratch, but it's, it's, it's modeled um, after real events. So somebody impersonated Warren Buffett's Twitter account. Warren Buffett here was misspelled with one T. Um, and they created, they got lots of followers, right? People were following Warren Buffett. He was tweeting out, invest in what makes you happy, um, and so on. You know, it was totally fake. Um, he got lots of followers. Um, and so, you know, it's based after real world events. And in the end, you get your certificate and you're a master of disinformation. So, does it work? That's the big question, right? Does it work? We did a paper looking at this. Um, so about half a million people play this game. People can opt into scientific research, give consent, and that allows us to get large data. Um, and we test people pre and post with several headlines. Um, and importantly, different headlines than people playing the game. So you get tested with these disinformation techniques. Um, but the examples are different. Um, so rather than inoculating people you know, with a vaccine that's based on the exact content, we tried to scale this approach by focusing on, on content more generally. So for example, instead of Donald Trump, you would get HBO here. This was before the actual Game of Thrones season, which we all know sucked. I'm sorry to say, uh, but the ending sucked. So the eighth season of Game of Thrones will be postponed to a salary dispute. Um, how reliable is this headline? Uh, and so on. And so you're asked this pre and post the game. This is uh, one on, uh, hey, Leo, it's snowing and freezing in New York. It's some of that global warming you're always going on about, uh, which is part of the trolling badge. Obviously, it's from Johnson Crude Oil. Um, and so people are asked to, to sort of rate the reliability of these headlines. So we got about 30,000 um, data points in the, uh, in the first trial of this game. Um, it wasn't a randomized trial, this is important to say, but we had some headlines that were real um, because we didn't want to make people more skeptical just across the board. And you can see here that people didn't change on the, on the real headlines, so they rated them the same, um, but on the disinformation techniques, conspiracy, impersonation, deflection, people significantly downgraded the reliability of these assessments. The effect sizes were about medium. They were not huge, but they're medium. Again, if you scale this across millions of people, when we talk about Brexit, why we're talking about a difference of four percentage points, if people are influenced by information that uses these techniques, um, that can actually make a real difference. Here's the density plot. So it's not just the means, but the whole distribution um, goes down after playing. So people think that it's less reliable. Um, Political biases, we do notice some things before people play the game. There's differences in ideology and education in terms of how well people do on the pretest. Um, but there's no differences on the post-test. So it doesn't matter what your ideology was, um, how old you were, what your education was. Everyone benefited from the game. There's some tiny differences in the effectiveness for different groups, but they were fairly tiny. I have to say there's one caveat. We didn't want to alienate people. So in the game, you can make fun of the government. You can make fun of big corporations. So it is possible people could craft a path that is ideologically congenial to their beliefs. So maybe that's why it works for different ideological groups. But that's kind of the purpose of the game. Um, but more to be said about this. Now, I have some very smart students, some of uh, whom which are here. Raccoon, in fact, sitting right here. He said, you know, this is great, but you really got to pre-register your stuff. Um, Pre-registration allows us to you know, pre-register in hypothesis and your analysis plan before you do the experiment, so then you can't change your conclusions afterwards. We created a plugin so other researchers could use the game and do testing with it. Um, we randomly assigned people to Tetris to get a, a, you know, a decent control group this time, um, just to control for the gamification element. One of the participant comments, is that what Cambridge has come to, having people play Tetris for 20 minutes? Uh, and that, yeah, in this case, um, it actually was. So what did we find? We found the same effects across the board. In fact, they were bigger this time on all of the badges, um, about 0.5 uh, on average, which is a medium effect size, but still quite decent. Um, in the control group, nothing happened. We just wanted to make sure that you know, giving people the same items twice doesn't have an effect in itself. So we just wanted to exclude that possibility. And then Raccoon did something very interesting. He wanted to look at um, change over time. What if people stop playing the game? What if you follow up with them you know, one week after, two weeks after, three weeks after? Does the effect last? You know, how long does the inoculation last? Do you need to go back to the doctor, get another sort of booster shot? Um, and what we found so far is quite impressive. 
one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks after, the effect stays relatively the same. Nothing happens in the control group, um, and the effect stays pretty much the same um, over time. Now, decay is inevitable, um, so if you follow up a few months after, it, it will probably drop off to uh, a significant uh, extent, and people may need a booster shot. Um, but it does last relatively long. Here are the, the density distributions. Another smart student, Melissa, who's also here today, who said, but what about confidence, right? It's great, people are sort of reducing the reliability. Um, and as Tali also mentioned, confidence is a key thing, confidence in your judgments of what's real and what's fake. Um, and um, confidence is key in resisting persuasion, in fact, because if you're not very confident in your beliefs, you can easily be persuaded to believe something else. These are averaged. We started to use many more items in the game, a large battery of sort of you know, fake items. We average them all together. Um, we see quite a big sort of effect for the game itself on reliability, um, but also on confidence. So people actually became uh, more confident in their judgments um, after they, they play the game. Um, so I'll sort of end it there. Uh, we were in the, in the uh, London Design Museum for a while because the game designers um, got some award and you know, displayed the game. So we were quite happy with, uh, with that. Um, we're doing some other cool stuff. So we gave some testimony to Parliament. Um, and, and really what we're hoping to do is try to change the policy conversation away from fact checking and debunking, which are good secondary tools. But if you can, prevention is key, right? This is what we call pre-bunking rather than debunking. So the, the, there's new signs of pre-bunking. Try to pre-bunk something. If that doesn't work, we can go to debunking and, and fact-checking. Um, luckily, it's being picked up by the EU, US State Department, uh, UK House of Parliament. Um, at least the idea is out there. People can run with it. Um, we're working with the FCO, different units in the FCO on translating the game. They've been incredibly helpful in translating the game into 50 new languages. Um, so these are all live, um, and we're trying to cover every major language out there so we can do large-scale cross-cultural um, testing. We have one for kids with more age-appropriate content. Um, again, many, many hard hours from John Rosenbeek. Uh, who, uh, who, pr who programs a lot of this work, um, basically impersonating the school principal. And you know, school's out, you start to know fake news, um, stuff that's more appropriate for younger kids. Uh, but the same lessons, the same lessons. Um, we work with social media companies, WhatsApp, as you know, dealing with very serious stuff, um, mob lynchings in, in India, uh, you know, where misinformation and rumors have led to death uh, and injury. So we've created a special version for WhatsApp. We're working with them on trying to implement that in rural India um, and do some interventions. Um, here's a prototype. This is very different now, WhatsApp, because you're dealing with group psychology, right? You get messages from people you trust in your network. Um, so we're working on that. We work with a nudge unit in the Middle East. And this is, you know, this is uh, the last slide that I'll talk about, a version called Radicalize. Um, we figured out that it's not just fake news. You can boil down the techniques that people use to persuade you of bad things um, for almost anything. You can, you can package that into some key lessons and try to inoculate people against those persuasion attempts. Um, so you know, based on the knowledge that our partners have in the Middle East, we boiled these techniques down to identifying a target, isolating the target, gaining their trust, which is part of the grooming stage, and then activating uh, the target. And you do this in the game by stepping into the shoes of a recruitment officer. Not Obviously, we want to keep it nice, so you're not, you know, you're not playing ISIS or anything. You're, you're, you're basically the anti-ICE freedom front, and you want to melt the global ice caps. Um, that's your mission, and you recruit people into your organization um, by looking at profiles, looking, learning who's vulnerable, um, and so on, um, to inoculate yourself against these techniques when it happens to you. you know, when you're out there in a vulnerable situation, hopefully people will recognize these techniques. And there's many more applications to come. I'll end it there. Thanks to our funders, game designers, students, um, everyone, and of course the audience for listening. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Antonio Silva, and I'm the head of integration and social cohesion at the Beverly Insights team. And today I'll be talking to you about two studies that we've run to try to understand what makes people susceptible to disinformation and how can we do something to tackle that susceptibility. So um, in the first part of the talk, I'll talk about a study um, on trying to establish what are the key factors that lead us to believe in misinformation. And then, based on those findings, 
uh, the interventions that we designed to try and tackle those factors to improve the resilience to misinformation. So there are, we, we are particularly interested in two main theories of why people believe in misinformation. And the first one is related to motivated reasoning, which in essence means that people have the tendency to believe information that is consistent with their existing ideas. And while there's a lot of research showing that this is the case in a US context, particularly around Republican and Democrats, there's less research than around what type of polarization and how this affects how we process information in an European context. And so we were interested in, in, doing, in, in replicating some of this research in Europe. Second, and this is more recent research, is the role that cognitive constraints play in whether we believe and share fake news and disinformation. And this is normally measured uh, or, or used as cognitive reasoning ability um, and is a way of measuring uh, the capacity you have to perceive information. And the, the reason why this is thought to be important is that when we encounter information, it's analytically taxing or costly to try and understand whether this is real or not. And so it's just easier to believe in something, easier to share something, instead of actually engaging with the information. And so that's why we think this may play a role in the way fake news is spread. So the, for the first study, our design, um, both studies were um, online experiments. Uh, with, with online panels in the UK and Eastern Europe. And in the first study, we had a sample of about 3,000 participants. And participants were presented with a range of real-world fake, bias, and truthful headlines. And this is a, a methodological difference from uh, Sanders' work, where here we show news that are out in the wild, both fake and real news that um, people may have encountered previously. Um, and then we asked them to write whether they thought they were true and whether they were willing to, to share that story. The main aim, as I said, was to try to understand the impact that motivated reasoning and cognitive reasoning ability has on the ability to discern fake news. But we're also interested, in addition, to test a range of other factors around personality traits, uh, around religiosity, that we think may play a role, and previous research has indicated that may play a role in, in, in the way we perceive information. So the main measures, um, just to recap, was uh, the main outcome of interest was uh, belief uh, in, in the news item, um, a series of demographic questions um, around political leanings and voting history, and then um, quite a long range, um, long selection of uh, psychometric uh, analysis or psychometric measures that have previously been linked to likelihood of believing in misinformation. This just gives you an idea of the type of stimuli that people are exposed to. So uh, people saw the news headline and the associated image as if they were to be shared on Facebook. They did not read the news article. This was just the headline and the image. And you can see here a, a range of um, pro-leave, pro-remain, um, pro-left, pro-right, pro and also neutral news that didn't have any political slant. Um, and then um, there was also a series of stimuli for Eastern Europe for relevant uh, political polarization over there. So for the key findings for the first study, we found that, um, as expected, higher cognitive reasoning ability improve the ability to discern between real and false headlines, replicating um, some of the most recent studies. We also find uh, strong evidence of motivated reasoning, and this is across the board. So also for both Romanian leave, left and right, and pro and anti-Russia supporters were much more likely to believe fake news that support their positions. And this was in, in all different uh, variations of this. And finally, we did not find almost any associations between all the personality characteristics we tested and beliefs in this information. So all our variation was explained either by cognitive reasoning ability or by motivated reasoning. So based on these findings, we decided to try and tackle these two issues through a series of behaviorally informed interventions that we hypothesized that may be successful in improving uh, our ability to discern uh, fake from real news. And so we ran another set of online experiments uh, in UK and Eastern Europe, this time with a sample of 9,000 participants, which we think is one of the largest uh, experimental trials done in the world in this topic. And Again, the, the design is very similar to the first study. Uh, participants were shown a range of news, and the main aim was to see whether we could improve the ability to detect 
fake from real news. Um, there was a series of small interventions uh, that we delivered. One, uh, the first one was values affirmation. This is a technique that's widely used in many different areas, particularly in education. And the idea is very simple. You just ask people to pick a value that's important to them and for a minute or two to think and explain why this is important to them. And in this case, they just typed in the reason why it's important. They had about a minute and a half, a minute to do this. And this has been shown to be very effective in increasing people's motivation, but also make people more confident in their sense of self. And therefore, we empathize they would reduce the sense, of, the sense of threat that they may feel from the other side. We also um, asked people uh, an accuracy prompt. So we asked people to stop and think before they responded or engaged with the news headline. So this was a question also a 10 minute, uh, sorry, a 10 second timer before people were asked to respond. And then we also provided people with rules of thumb. So rules of thumb is uh, an approach that's been used in the past. What we tried to design here is rules of thumb that are actually easy to follow and they're actionable. So the four ones that we identified, first was check the news source. This is something that's been uh, shown to be effective about 80, 85% of the times. If you know the news source, it's unlikely that it's fake news or complete uh, fake. Um, to assess the content, just think, is this claim logical? And also, if you have any doubts, why don't put the headline in Google? The, the, if you don't find any other source, from this is unlikely to be true. Most fake news are single sourced. Check your bias. Here essentially we explain to people what motivated reasoning is. If you want the news to be true so much, think again, it probably isn't or it might not be. And finally, uh, monitor your memory. Um, as Sanders said, if uh, we, we've seen a news, a news story beforehand, we're more likely to believe it. This is the case even when we tell people that this news is fake. Um, and then we ask them two weeks later whether this news is real or not. They're more likely to say yes just because they've, they've been exposed to it before. So it's important to, to think whether we might have encountered the news item before. And we delivered this intervention together. So this is three interventions where we call the main treatment that uh, people received. And then for a subsample, we also gave a further, two further interventions. One was disputed tax, so we added the disputed sign to the news item. This is similar to approaches that have been tested previously, uh, particularly on Facebook, and we wanted to test whether this may be effective. We didn't want to say that the news was fake to avoid uh, potentially some backfire effects. We just say there's some disputed sources about this news item. And then finally, we showed related articles. So instead of saying that the news is dis disputed, simply in the, instead of the related articles, just following what the, 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 the news item normally shows, which is what commonly happens on YouTube or Facebook. In this case, the related article showed an alternative viewpoint. So we didn't tell people you're wrong or this is not true. We just say this is the other side of the story. Um, this is the trial design. So this was a randomized controlled trial. So the first, uh, in the first 10 news item, we split the sample in two. Half just saw the news item and the other half saw our main treatment. So values affirmation, uh, accuracy prompt and rules of thumb. And then we re-randomize into seeing three further news items, which are either the related uh, news item, the disputed tags, or uh, another control. So no, no, just simply the news items. The, the key findings we found was that overall the main treatment, um, so vowels affirmation, rules of thumb, and accuracy prompts, but, and disputed tags reduce false beliefs. Um, across uh, the different regions uh, that we worked. And the main treatment was very effective in reducing motivated reasoning. So in reducing polarization, the likelihood of people believing the, new, the fake news that supports their arguments uh, compared with uh, the other side. And to give you an idea of what the, the, this actually means in terms of numbers, in terms of news items, I'll show you here the, the headlines that, uh, a selection of headlines that were shown to people. So here are fake headlines, fake or heavily misleading. So we're interested in a, in, a, in, a, in a combination of not just completely fake, but also misleading headlines. And so here we've got news uh, that supports a pro-leave argument, for example, the fact that queen, the Queen backs Brexit. Um, we had uh, pro-remain fake news, for example, the march did not have three million people. And then we also uh, pro-left news and pro-right-wing news, so more supportive in general of the Labour Party, of the Conservative Party. And then we asked people um, whether they thought this was accurate or not. Um, and we measured what was the difference between a Remainer, so someone that voted uh, Remain in, in the referendum, of believing something compared to someone that voted Leave believing something. 
And what this numbers shows here, uh, what we call the, the value polarization, is the difference between the two groups in believing the news. And so if we had a value of zero, this would mean that there's no polarization, meaning that the both sides are equally likely to believe a news item. And the higher the number, this goes up to five. This is, you can imagine this is a Likert scale. One means you don't believe, five means you believe. Um, and the highest the number, the, 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 the larger the polarization. And so this is the baseline numbers. This is all, all, all the control numbers, what, what people said. And then we, we want to know what, what is the polarization for compared to our treatment group. And what we find is that a substantial reduction in the level of polarization for the same news item for people that receive the, our treatment. So you can see, for example, for Queen Back's Brexit, it goes from 0.44 to 0.1. So there's almost no difference between the way Remainers and Leavers perceive the truthfulness of, of this information. And by the way, we reduced the, the, the perception of truthfulness, so people, both sides are less likely to believe it's true, uh, by nearly re making the gap disappear between the two sides. We, we, also showed, um, we also showed the headlines, as I said, to Eastern Europe, so we're interested in, in finding out whether this type of, of intervention and polarization works in different contexts. And so in this context, we're more interested in um, like a pro-Russia, anti-Russia uh, slants, which is kind of politically, or from a policy perspective, more, uh, more interesting and relevant work. And uh, what you find here, again, a high level, higher levels of polarization between the two sides. So you can see it's 1.10 is the average uh, uh, polarization to the news items. And then we, now I'll show you now what happens when they receive our treatment. So we, we find, again, a very substantial reduction in the levels of polarization. Just to remind you, this treatment was, it was values affirmation, accuracy prompts, rules of thumb, and then either related or disputed tags. And for example, in the example of the anti-Russia fake news of Russia is experiencing economic co collapse, the threat of sanctions, what we find it goes from 1.38, so very large levels of polarization, to nearly zero. So virtually no difference in the way perceive that uh, information once they receive a, our, um, our interventions. Now, we, we showed, as I said, we showed a series of fake news or misleading news, but what is really important is to see why we also have to show them real news and find the difference between what, how, we don't want people to stop believing real news. Um, and so the, the, most of the, 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 the metrics that, that we're measuring is the difference between real and fake um, and trying to reduce that gap. But we also need to see how the, our intervention with affect polarization in, in facts, in reality. And so this is real news, both, again, pro-leave, pro-remain, left and right. And again, probably unsurprising, we find there's a polarization on the likelihood of people believing real news that supports their side and not their side. And then we want to see what happens with our treatment to the perception of reality. And what we find is there's no change. So our intervention made no impact in the way people perceive reality, despite making quite a substantial difference in the way people perceived uh, fake news or, or, or false news. And the same thing is found both in uh, the UK and Eastern Europe. Again, absolutely no difference in the levels of polarization um, that we find in Eastern Europe. And, and yeah, this is the, the kind of the, the main headline uh, of the results of, of our studies. To, to conclude, we were able to address, to, to tackle disinformation, but this required a series of small, multiple interventions. So no interventions on our own was effective in, in either reducing polarization or um, uh, tackling the reduction of, of false beliefs in general. But combined, we, we were quite successful in reducing uh, both the ability of people to take fake news, but we think at least the effect size is a lot bigger. So, for example, in the likelihood of, of people believing fake news that supports the previous held beliefs, so we had a reduction of about 61%, um, so that we're able to, put in other words, bring the countries together um, when it comes to fake news. Um, however, as, as I pointed out, there was no shift of polarization based on real news or based on reality. What we are excited now is to take this research and see what happens in the real world, in the real online world. As, as I said, mentioned before, this was done in an online panel. So one of the limitations is whether this would apply to the way people experience news in the real world. So what we're really interested in is, is trying this in online platforms to... Uh, first get external validity, but also 
behavioural measures that people are actually doing. So are people sharing more or less of fake news after they receive our interventions? And this is what we're really excited to text, uh, test next. And that's it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much um, for those three really illuminating talks. Uh, very different aspects of, of the issues and what some of the interventions we've tried to do something about them. Um, it, it seems to me one of the things that we hear in this space about disinformation is the language of immunity or spread or contagion or inoculation. And um, not being a virologist myself, I, 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 I do have a sense that one of the things that's helped us make progress in actually tackling the spread of things that we don't want to spread is understanding those who are less susceptible uh, to, to it. So who, who survives well, who's resilient and in, in a more psychological rather than medical language. And I, I just wondered, I mean, this question probably first to Tali, but I, I just wondered what, what your thoughts were on how much progress we can make on actually understanding. You mentioned there's conflicting evidence about intelligence, for example. Well, like how much do we know and how much more progress can we make on figuring out you know, what those special ingredients might be? Well, I think the best evidence just came from Antonio, because he just showed us that none of the personality traits, mm -hmm. none of the demographic traits, none of that was related to um, people's mm -hmm. likelihood in believing misinformation and fake news. So um, I don't think there's a lot of research about it, mm -hmm. but um, you know, that's quite striking. Yeah. Um, and if that is true, um, maybe it's not very encouraging for that type of research that you just suggested. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, um, he does find some um, or strong evidence for, for cognitive analytical abilities. Um, so perhaps that's a path to go. Again, there's a little bit of, of um, conflicting evidence about that. I think, I, I think it's more the issues being tested rather than the evidence are conflicting. So, i.e., maybe it depends on the context, mm -hmm. what exactly we're looking at, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So, um, yeah, the bottom line, I don't know, just, just looking what Antonio said suggests to me that maybe, maybe that's not going to be helpful in this, uh, this issue. But, yeah. So, do, does anybody want to add anything to that? Because, uh, I mean, beyond the kind of top five personality traits, I suppose there can be aspects of parenting or, or kinds of education systems that you know, are, are the things that we think are out there that we might want to harness. Yes, yeah, so, so that's one of the reasons we started this re research, because there's a lot of exactly. other studies out there pointing out different types of personality, different types of, of, of mental states that lead people to believe more or less. And we found very little in, in our very kind of large sample. We think part of the reason why previous studies is relatively small sample sizes, the way mm -hmm. those results are found. Um, but the, the two main things, as I said, was our political polarizations, or the size we believe, and then cognitive reasoning ability. And we think those two are probably the most promising areas to, to tackle. So, for mm -hmm. example, in cognitive reasoning ability, it's very difficult to shift that. We're not going to increase or decrease. But what we can do is make the way information is, is provided easier to, to, to access and understand. And, for example, providing rules of thumb is something that just makes easier to process the information and mm -hmm. make those decisions. And similar with motivated reasoning is probably more complicated, but something that I think a lot of the speakers in this conference and here talk is possible to reduce polarization and make people slightly more rational mm -hmm. in the way they perceive information. So, yeah. Very good. Yes, I think, Oh, you go. Go ahead. Um, no, I, I just to jump in as well. I think I think that context really matters. I guess mm -hmm. is, is the point here. So there, there's a there's a couple of studies that were published in January this year, and forgive me, I can't remember the authors um, that did find, for example, age effects, which were kind of the headline of the study, albeit mm -hmm. that wasn't necessarily the main finding. Happily, the main finding is around actually people are not as susceptible as we all worry about them being. But at least one of those was um, had kind of naturalistic um, you know, e external validity in the sense that it looked retrospectively at the information that people had shared on Facebook during the um, sort of in, in the run-up to the US election. So it was looking at people's real behavior, mm. um, which is always the challenge, of course, in experimental research, how, 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 how like that is the real world. Um, but it's just, it, we just, you continually find, and I think that's why our, um, the kind of sample size and the cross-cultural look that we've been um, utilising is, is really 
helpful um, is that the, there's just such a mixed picture. So we're, we're very invested, I guess, in this idea of motivated reasoning, and we certainly find evidence that that exists. But then you've got kind of papers from Pennycook and Rand finding that in some cases, actually, people are just, to quote their, their paper title, they're lazy, not biased. So we don't necessarily always find that that's what's going on. I think it's very kind of context specific whether or not people are kind of driven by certain factors to believe particular news. Um, and so there is no one size fits all, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think we've also done some studies on personality and found no relation with personality uh, uh, in particular. Um, so, so that seems to be the case. But yeah, there, there have been a few studies, it was in science on, on Facebook that came out showing that older people are vulnerable. Some conversations we have with Google, they're, they're concerned about the elderly and their ability to um, be persuaded by false content online more generally, for example, as a, as a vulnerable group. Mm -hmm. um, I do think when you look at how fake news spreads, they use models from epidemiology to try to understand the diffusion process, right? So, so it maps onto that. So I do think you can think about groups that are more susceptible. Uh, for example, the editor of our paper was very concerned with showing that our intervention actually worked for those who were most susceptible um, at, the, at the outset of the intervention. And we found that they actually benefited the most. Um, but their susceptibility wasn't associated with their ideology or their education necessarily. So I think people are susceptible to disinformation techniques uh, in general, and some people more than others. But I think, yeah, we need more research to try to identify who might be susceptible and who might benefit from what kind of intervention. I think, as Lizzie said, context really matters. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That, that's really interesting. I, I mean, I guess a, a separate question is whether we might see generational change, because, uh, you know, it's an N of only a few, but I, I know with the, some of the younger people I know that they, they are quite skeptical of what they read online, and they, they do check the provenance of the information more than I think some of us might have reading the newspapers at their age, but, but maybe that's. Um, so we, we have Lizzie here. It's, it's fantastic to have someone who's working on this sort of uh, at, a, at a kind of academic researcherly level, but from inside government and um, you know, running the ESRC, thinking about what are the really important things we need to fund and know more about in the coming years. For me, it seems really important that we advance the state of knowledge, but that we also make it as useful as possible, that we really try to understand how we can bridge across from research into policy so that you know, those of you working from, from inside government can actually start to help um, leverage some of that and bring about some of the changes we would like to see. From your perspective, what do you think is, is most needed in this field? What would help you if you could say to, if you had a funder sitting here and you could say, well, you know, here, here's what would really help us. Here's the studies that we would really like to see um, informing what we do. Um, well, this, the scale of the problem, I think, is, is question one. So rather than necessarily assuming that mm -hmm. we're all affected by, um, by kind of fake news, disinformation, misinformation, um, getting some picture of actually how big that impact is, which is incredibly mm -hmm. difficult to measure. So, you, we, you know, we can kind of use proxies of whether somebody says that they believe something or whether somebody shares something online, um, but that doesn't necessarily, um, which, which I should add, I guess, you know, sharing fake content is, um, is I guess, a harm in itself if you're, then, if you're then kind of spreading that, whether or not you personally believe it. Um, but the kind of subsequent behaviour, does that subsequently affect the way um, whether or not you get your children vaccinated or whether or not you vote a particular way is... Um, L more of an unknown, I mm -hmm. suppose. So, bridging the gap between belief and behaviour, attitudes and behaviour, is um, a big area, I guess, for us. Um, broadening out the research from being quite US heavy is another um, another priority, and that's what we've uh, we've done with the BIT. Um, and then. It's kind of being able to scale things up and test them, I guess, with civil society uh, is is our kind of next steps, I guess, trying to get that more um, ecological validity, try it in the real world, and does it actually, does it, do, do, does it have the same principles when we're looking at it in exp from an experimental view? Mm. Great, thank you. I, I mean, on that note, we've talked a bit about consumers and we've talked a bit about some of the sources of information. 
Um, the, the platforms themselves, it seems to me, if you really want to do something about this as a policymaker or, or anyone else for that matter, you, you need to think about how to access the, uh, you know, the platforms and, and get them to understand what the challenges are and what they could actually do about them, whether it's health warnings or anything else. Um, Xander, would you like to say anything about uh, what, what you think is, is a way to kind of help the platforms understand and, and help make sure that, that we make progress on actually doing something about it at that level through the mechanisms? Yeah, I'm afraid I'll have to keep it broad because I'm not sure if I have ideas that are specific enough, but I think Lizzie's point about behavior is really important. So, so people have motivational biases, you know, confirmation bias and so on. We know people share stuff. Um, but even the studies that have come out, they look at snapshots of publicly available social media data. The companies are sitting on tons and tons, millions and millions of people that researchers don't have access to, sometimes for good reason. Um, but the problem is that um, they're the only ones who really know what's going on in terms of what people share, not necessarily the academic uh, uh, community. We can make limited inferences based on snapshots of, of real world data, um, how it actually affects voting behavior. Um, and so I think for these companies, they do have the data, so they could potentially design interventions um, that are effective. I know Facebook played around with the, uh, with the um, you know, tagging stuff, which was, wasn't, wasn't optimal. Um, there's a lot of mixed research out there. Some, show, some sort of show that's effective, some sort of show is less effective. Um, but I think the key AI for, for, the, for them is really to prevent rather than cure, because they're constantly running behind uh, the actual, the actual uh, interventions, right? Something happens, Facebook has to react. They have to fix it um, after the fact. Mm -hmm. They're not thinking proactively about how can they really prevent this in their policies from happening in the first place. Mm. They turn to a lot of AI solutions. We don't want to do it. We don't want to be arbiters of truth. We're going to defer to the machines. Um, I think to some extent technology is why we're uh, in, this, in this mess, so to speak. Mm. So I think I'm worried that they're not thinking proactively enough. Mm -hmm. Great. Would any of you, the rest of you, like to comment on, uh, you know, how receptive you think the platforms might be to some pre-bunking or some other tools? I think um, they're definitely talking about wanting policy. Mm -hmm. So Mark Zuckerberg um, was saying recently he wants policy to be in place. He mm -hmm. actually does not want um, it to be the Facebook responsibility, mm -hmm. but, and, and also not to be specific to Facebook, but he's actually calling for governments to put in policy in place um, to help them with this problem and to prevent the problem. And one of the reasons, of course, that he's doing that is because of the incentives. I mean, they, they had very negative impact on them in many different ways because of this. But I think I agree with, with that view that a lot of the responsibility is on government mm -hmm. and putting in place policy uh, to help. Mm -hmm. right, Lizzie, the view from, from in government? Fortunately, I don't have the responsibility of, um, <laughs> of having to persuade platforms. But I, I, think, I think that, yeah, I would agree that it, there's a big onus on government. There's, a, there's arguably sometimes a tendency, I guess, for government to force um, platforms into take charge of the problem because the problem is largely happening on, you know, on their patch, as it were. But I think it needs to be a little bit of give and take and carrot and stick and collectively with academia figuring out how, how do you best solve this problem. It needs to be, um, needs to be two ways. Hence, kind of trying to do some of our own research, yeah. yeah. I think ultimately it's going to be very difficult to convince online platforms to radically change the way they operate and, and the bottom line. And I think that's why when we were thinking of interventions to design, we purposefully thought of interventions that could be potentially applicable, that wouldn't radically change the way things work. Mm -hmm. um, so if they were to be effective, you had a bigger chance of convincing them to adopt them mm -hmm. because nothing very, I mean, it's very difficult to convince them to anything very large. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to think of, that's why I think behavioral insights and kind of light touch interventions are particularly suited to this because they're easier to sell to the, the, the mm -hmm. public platforms. And it's bigger than platforms too, I think. This mm -hmm. is a, it's not just about complete, it's not, you know, that kind of helps with exposure, I guess. Like the platforms enable that, the familiarity to kind of make you believe stuff and all that. Um, you know, it's very easy to share information, but. Um, you know, media bias generally has existed for a long time. So this is just a this is just the same part of that problem, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like people selecting, you know, to your point, where, where they go for their information and shielding themselves from 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 the kind of what, what might tell them the opposite. Um, which means the problem is bigger than just platforms could do. It's, mm -hmm. It needs to come from you know inoculating and educating people in the first instance. That being said, Google is helping us 
helping yeah, us true. <laughs> to do that, right? So we have our bias, but the problem is, of course, that these platforms are just making the bias much, much bigger yeah. by using specific yeah. algorithms. So just look at Google, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's this kind of interaction where we have a bias that we've have you know evolved, um, and then these platforms take these biases and then just expand them more and more. Yeah, yeah. I will say that you know legislating content and social media companies has been controversial, uh, less so in Europe. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I do think is interesting, and some of Betsy Pollock's work shown this, that that laws do signal norms uh, as a behavioral intervention. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if you know if there are some laws that signals that there's a need to to address it, like smoking is a great example. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Great. Well, I think we have just a couple of minutes remaining. If we could turn to the Slido very briefly to see whether there are uh, one or two quick questions we could pull out before everybody goes to have their lunch. Have we got the Slido? Slido. The questions oh, on the Slido. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Great. Um, so let's have a quick look. Uh, why don't, why don't we go with the last one for now, just to end on a very controversial note. Um, are, are <laughs> there, I'll slightly rephrase. Are, are there circumstances in which misinformation might be good? Or, or do we need to challenge the, the premise that misinformation is, is definitely bad? Um, it, you know, is, there, is there anything you'd like to say about that? I'll have a quick one. I, uh, according to my definition, misinformation isn't bad in itself. It could just be uh, an error and it's nobody's fault. I think disinformation is by default bad. Mm -hmm. I, th yeah, I think that it's important to make a distinction between full-on fake news, things mm -hmm. that are just complete lies, and biased news, which yeah. is just omitting facts. And I think, I think that's, they actually operate in very different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think biased news, heavily biased news, is actually much more problematic from a policy perspective mm. than, than fake news, particularly in the European context where fake news are actually quite rare in the way they spread. But the big problem is news that are not lies, but they omit so much of the facts or the way they're presented is so biased. And I would say that's really actually the problem. But uh, just to take another view, I think, um if the consequence, what, what matters in my view is the consequences. And if the consequences of misinformation are quite large, uh, climate change, for example, mm. you know, vaccines, for example, um, a lot of that is misinformation and the consequences are quite severe. And I wonder whether a lot of the times the consequences are more severe in response to misinformation than fake news. Mm. Um, there's some studies showing that fake news doesn't have much of an impact on voting at all. Mm. Um, so if I think that's what we should be looking at. Great. Um, what, one other question, which slightly turns on its head, one of the ones that's there, but um, so that we all go out uh, on, a, on a slightly more positive note, um, what, what would you, as friends, colleagues, uh, parents, uh, people in the room, what would you advise people to take away from this? What's the one or two things you would say, well, here's what you can do to help in an everyday context so that we can start to try and address this? I think, so the reason why... Um, uh, one of the interventions that we've trialled is values affirmation, which is kind of my favourite in the sense because it is positive. Mm. Um, it's really just about, you know, tackling motivated reasoning by making it kind of creating a culture or an environment where people are more ready to challenge their own beliefs. So, it, you know, values affirmation as an exercise is about building somebody's ego so that they they feel, you know, okay about being wrong about something else, kind of thing. So, I think that's. I think that's what I would champion, that it's, it's, it's acceptable to challenge your own beliefs sometimes and, and there's nothing kind of to be ashamed of with that and to be on the defensive is, is not helpful. Um, I think in, it, what I would take away is how we communicate information. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all communicating information, but we do that also just as parents, mm -hmm. right, as, as colleagues. Um, and in order to have other people believe us more or try to you know listen to us more there's a few things that we can we can learn and one is that it's better to come from an agreeing point of view mm -hmm. so the worst thing you can do is come in and say no no you're totally wrong mm -hmm. um, and, and that's our instinct often mm -hmm. right um, but rather say well listen we agree on this or we have the same motive um, and from that point of view the other person's more likely to take in our, our research clearly shows that if you're coming from an agreeing point of view people listen to you more. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to think about that when we communicate information to others. I agree, absolutely. Um, <laughs> anyone but else? But if someone disagrees, please. <laughs> Bring it on. 
I, th I think it's, it's a follow-up to, to Liz's point, but it's about knowing your own biases. So uh, yeah. just be question your own perceptions of, of, of news. Mm -hmm. and I think that the understanding of, of mot motivated reasoning is one area that I think we've been exploring in general behavioral insights. Is what if we explain to people what we're doing, what are the behavioral barriers or biases that people have? Will they actually change their behavior once they understand? And we think this is a kind of st a starting point for that. If you understand how you operate, perhaps you can regulate and better the way you behave. And so I think that would be a thing to take okay. away. To take on, I'm not sure if we're creating a bandwagon effect here, but, but, but I, <laughs> I, I, I would agree uh, with uh, what Lizzie said. I think part of the success of the game is premised on the idea that it's not ideological. I mean, we don't go as far as allowing people to affirm their conspiracy theories, for example, but it does allow people to um, create content that they either agree or disagree with and learn about disinformation techniques in general. Mm -hmm. um, from either side um, that we then hope people take, you know, and and use in their daily lives. Um, and so, essentially, it's about disarming people, right? Allowing them to learn in an environment that is not hostile towards their beliefs. Um, and so, I think that's you know that's part of the solution. And then the other part, I think, is helping each other. I think the vaccine metaphor doesn't work if people don't help each other to inoculate themselves against disinformation. Fantastic. Well, thank you. This has been an absolutely uh, brilliant and informative discussion, and I, I really um, think we should all be thanking the speakers uh, heartily in just a moment. The worst kind of chairing is that which stops people getting to their lunch, but I can see there's a lot of brilliant research to be funded for the future in this area, so I hope you're all uh, looking for ways to, to take this field further. Thank you.